Okay. Uh, I am just to confirm. Can can you all hear me? Yes. Okay. Great. Okay. So today we're going to talk about uh, Gaussian Gaussian beams, and let me just show you a picture of where where we're going, which is the the picture that I showed at the end of last time. It's just the Jupyter notebook that I've uploaded to Sakai. So sharing that. So this is plane waves, real and complex. Let me just evaluate a few things. So load the load the animation ability. Let me load my ability to plot complex numbers. And now let me go down to the bottom where I had some of the Gaussian beam stuff. All right, so hopefully this will show up. Yes, there we go. All right, so this is this is where we're going today. We will look at beams that look like this. So you can imagine that inside of a laser cavity, uh, the phase of the light uh, changes every what every wavelength. And so I'm plotting along the z-axis here in units of wavelengths. So every every one unit of z, the phase goes from red, which is pure real, to red again, which is pure real. And the shape of this is a particular form that will work out. And the cross section, if I were to take a cross section and plot the intensity as a function of x and y, that cross section would look Gaussian. And I, I played around with some of the parameters last time. Let me go down. Um, well, let me let me show you this. So the intensity of this of this beam is just the magnitude of this complex number squared. And so anytime there's small magnitude, squaring it will make it even smaller. So the intensity profile of the beam looks much more flat than the amplitude profile of the beam. And you can imagine this is what's at the center of the laser cavity, and then what comes out of the one of the mirrors just continues to, to follow this pattern, Gaussian in profile. Uh, expanding with some some characteristic angle here. Um, I think I have an animation of trying different parameters. Right. So in addition to the wavelength of light, the one free parameter that we have when specifying these beams is what's called the beam waste. It's a measure of how uh, how big the beam is in uh, it's like a, a radio measure. So hold on, let me let the animation go for a few clicks here and I'll stop it. So, so this is an animation of increasing beam waste. And as the beam waste increases, you can see that the beam becomes more and more uniform. Hold on. Wow. Oh. Whatever reason when I do this, Zoom the animations are always much slower. Okay. So here, let me, I think I can do this and it will give me a slider to drag around. Computing, computing, computing. Okay. So this is a, a very small beam waste. And as I increase the beam waste, the light becomes more and more and more uniform. Now, again, this is, this is plotted in units of wavelength. So as soon as I get up a, a beam waste of you know, two or three wavelengths, you know, probably around there, it looks it looks pretty, pretty flat. And two or three wavelengths isn't that much. These, these laser beams aren't usually that focused, which is why, you know, in reality, if I were to actually take a laser that we have in the lab, it's gonna be way off of this, way off of this chart. It's gonna look extremely, extremely uniform. But just for plotting purposes, so we could both see the, the scale of the wavelengths. Um, I'm going to plot kind of a slightly exaggerated uh, Gaussian Gaussian beams. All right, so that's where we're going today. We're going to sort of start from Maxwell's equations and derive these solutions. But I, I want to want to have you uh, have some picture in mind as we're going through all this. So so let's let's actually start here. So if we start with Maxwell's equations, um, so Maxwell, Maxwell, uh, possibly in in media, 
but no, no sources. So uh, even, even the laser, there, you know, there's a source of light, but that's just adding a little bit of light to the existing light that's already there. And certainly outside of the laser as the beam propagates, which is mostly what we're gonna be talking about, um, there are no sources of light. So this is a pretty good approximation, except for the little bit of additional light that, that the atoms occasionally add. A laser, is, uh, a laser cavity is, is mostly empty. There's a little bit of, uh, in our case, helium and neon, but that, those, uh, it's much less than atmospheric pressure. So in terms of uh, the light actually propagating through it, it's easier to propagate through that laser cavity than it is to propagate through air because there's less stuff there. It's just we're zapping that stuff with electricity. So it's occasionally emitting a little bit more light into that cavity. Let's not worry about the sources for now. Let's just look at the, what the shape of the beam is without sources. And we'll talk about how sources actually make the laser light uh, once, once we establish the pattern of the light itself. All right, so what are, what are Maxwell's equations? Well, we defined D is D to be epsilon E and B is mu H. And of course, epsilon is epsilon naught that we're, we know and love times some order one factor depending on the media we're in, which is you know for air and for vacuum is pretty much one. Uh, mu is mu naught times some order one factor, which is really about one. And Maxwell's equations are that the divergence of D is, has to do with the free charges rho, but for no free charges around, it's gonna be zero. Divergence of B, always zero, there are no magnetic monopoles. Curl of E, it's Faraday's law is minus partial B partial T. And curl of H, this is Ampere's law, is plus partial D partial T. And you know, all, all the constants have gotten absorbed into these definitions here, making these equations a little bit simpler and easier to work with. Okay, now remember, how did we get the wave equation? Well, we took Faraday's law and we took the curl again. So the curl of the curl of E is minus the time derivative of the curl of B. I'll use a definition of B and use this, this uh, Ampere's law for the curl of B to get it related to the time derivative of D and D is related to E. And so I'm not gonna go through that whole process again, but what you get out is a wave equation for the electric field that the Laplacian of E is, and you know, we got a, a mu from substituting in B for H and we got a epsilon substituting in D for E and the mu and epsilon combined to give you a C squared. So one over C squared times the time derivative of E. And so, so what, what is this an equation for? Well, it's an equation for each component of the electric field. And, and for this equation, each component is separate, right? There's a, the X component of this equation is unrelated to the Y component, which is unrelated to the Z component. So we have three independent wave equations for each, each of the three independent components. And those three components still have to satisfy this equation. So after we get solutions to the the wave equation for each of the components, we have to check that our solution still satisfies uh, Gauss's law. But you know, one, one path we could take, oh, and th there are lots and lots and lots of different solutions to the wave equation. These are not unique. They may be unique given certain boundary conditions, but right now we're just looking for solutions and we'll examine their properties and we'll kind of reverse engineer. We'll find nice solutions and we'll say, what are the boundary conditions that, that might make sense to, to put on, say, uh, a laser cavity in order to get those solutions that we, that we want, that have nice properties? And we saw before that one set of solutions are, are plane waves. And those are, in some sense, the simplest solutions. Those are solutions where there are no boundary conditions, that things can just go off to infinity with, with nothing, uh, nothing special happening. Um, or, uh, or sines and cosines where you have boundary conditions where things are in a box. Those, those solutions are uh, useful for where, where there are boundary conditions that are uh, 
that are rectangular. Um, here we're going to talk about uh, these other kind of solutions. And, and so, so more, more generally, let's, let's set this problem up a little, in a little bit more generality. So, so last time we considered plane wave solutions, which we, where we specified both the x dependence and the time dependence. Here we're going to say, let's let E, our, our real E field, which depends on space and time, we're going to let that equal some complex E plus component, which just depends on space. And we're going to specify that we're only going to look at monochromatic fields, oops, e to the minus i omega t. And uh, for, for plane waves, the form of this was just e to the plus i k dot r. But we're going to come up with a more, uh, you know, a, we're going to look at the formula for this and come up with a different solution today, plus, plus the complex conjugate of this term to get a real solution. And Remember, because Maxwell's equations are linear, uh, we can just look at this component, plug it in, and get a solution uh, that just involves this prefactor times this monochromatic uh, time dependence. And once we have this, we can take its complex conjugate, get the real component, uh, calculate the intensity, do all the other things we typically do. So, so let's just focus on just this, what's called the positive frequency component, and plug it into Maxwell's equations and see what we get. So, so we're just taking this, this one and plugging it into, plug into this wave equation. All right, so, so plugging it in, the, the first term, the Laplacian here, is just the spatial Laplacian. So it just acts on this, this first piece. So this just gives us a Laplacian of E plus of R times e to the minus i omega t. This equals, um, I might run out of room here. Let me go to the next line. This equals, well, one over c squared, okay. Uh, they're taking two time derivatives here, but all the time dependence is in here. So this is just e, e plus r. And two time derivatives of this, bring down two factors of minus i omega. So minus i omega squared, and then e to the minus i omega t, uh, which may be off the board for some of you. But that's OK, because it's going to cancel out. So this particular time dependence is nice, because it goes away, and we're left with a time-independent equation for the time-independent component, uh, which is good. And let me let me sort of rearrange things a little bit. Let me just call this uh, minus omega squared over c squared e plus of r. And let me define this as k squared. So minus k squared e plus of r. So this is the same k that we had before except it's, we're interpreting it slightly differently. So let me just write this equation here, e plus of r. So k is just defined to be omega over c. So for different, uh, and it has units. So units of something like radians, radians per meter. So for a particular color of light, which corresponds to a particular frequency, uh, you get a particular spatial frequency, a particular k out. And let me just arrange this equation a little bit more to, to be the equation that we're going to work with. I'm just going to sort of factor out the operators here. Laplacian plus k squared acting on e plus of r equals 0. And this equation has a name. It's the, uh, uh, I, should, I should have put vectors on all these things. The equation has a name. It's called the vector Helmholtz equation. Equation. So this equation comes up a lot. Um, 
you know, maybe without the vector symbol, it would be a scalar Humboldt equation that comes up in uh, a lot of acoustic resonators and things like that. Uh, with this vector symbol, it just means that each component has to satisfy this equation. So there'll be an equation for the X component, an equation for the Y component, an equation for the Z component. And right now we're just gonna pick one component and focus on it. Uh, okay, so now there are a lot of solutions to this differential equation and uh, solutions that we've already considered would be sines and cosines for standing waves, uh, e to the i k dot r, like we talked about before for traveling plane waves, that, that would be a solution. Um, if you have some, some spherical cavity, some of you may have taken quantum, if you have spherical boundary conditions, often you end up with vessel functions of various kinds. Those would be solutions. Um, spherical waves. Uh, so let, let me just write example. Spherical wave, uh, e to the i k r over r. If you write this Laplacian and spherical coordinates and plug in this solution, this is a solution to this equation. And this is the kind of wave you'll use in the homework, the kind of wave that comes out of a, um, a kind of a point source. And, and you'll, uh, you'll show in the homework what, what interference of two spherical waves looks like. Uh, you get this ring pattern that you may have seen in the movie. Um, but we're, we're interested in, in laser beams and laser cavities and also fiber optics. And, and these kind of solutions have, have this form, uh, have a form of uh, a Gaussian cross-section. So let me process this a little bit more and then I'll, I'll show you why these are the right solutions. And so we're gonna process this equation a bit and then we're going to write, uh, write a solution to it, which one can check with Mathematica. Fortunately, I cannot check with Mathematica because I reinstalled everything on my computer and I, ha I haven't re-registered Mathematica yet. I was gonna show you a simple check, but maybe I can either do that next time or I could do it over at my desktop or uh, I can leave that as an exercise for the reader or, or we could you know, do a whole lot of taking derivatives in algebra, which is not that exciting, but uh, I'll, I'll talk about uh, I'll talk about how to get the solutions that we care about. All right. So I hope I put some of this in, in context where we're not focused on totally generic solutions in Maxwell equation. We're still focused on monochromatic solutions, single color, single frequency. And we're just looking at different spatial patterns that satisfy Maxwell's equations. All right, so, so the first step is that we want a beam that's mostly going in the Z direction. Uh, you, you, saw, you saw my picture of, uh, of screen sharing the animation. It was, it was mostly a beam with wave fronts that were pretty vertical. And if I were to animate it, all I do is I take those wave fronts and I, I multiply them by a, e to the minus i omega t. And when I do that, it just looks like they're all shifting, shifting off to the right. Uh, but I'm going to consider, I'm, I'm gonna sort of make that explicit. I'm gonna say, we are really interested in solutions that are mostly traveling in the z direction. So I'm gonna start out by saying, let's look at e plus uh, of r in the form of some envelope times e to the i k z. So, so far all I've done is I've made my life more complicated. I've taken this function of x, y, and z and replaced it with another function of x, y, and z times this z dependence. Uh, and, and the reason why I'm doing that is when I plug this in, I'm gonna get some, uh, some nice, uh, some nice uh, cancellations. So let me let me do that. 
So I need to calculate the Laplacian of this thing. And the Laplacian is the sum of the following terms. So two derivatives with respect to x of e plus. Well, x only x here. So this will just give me two derivatives of psi, two derivatives of y of e plus. Again, that just gives me two y derivatives of psi. And now the trickier one. Uh, oh, sorry, and, and e to the i k z comes along for the ride here. e to the i k z. Now the trickier one is two derivatives of with respect to z of e plus. All right, so here I have to use the chain rule and I have to do it twice. So let me do this in two steps. First, I'm going to keep one derivative out, and then I'm going to take the, the z derivative of this. There's a, a sorry, a product rule. So there's a product rule here. So the product rule tells me that first I need to take the derivative of psi, so d psi, dz, and I'll keep the e to the i kz. And the second term says I need to take the derivative of this. So this is just psi e to the i kz times i k. And now I'll take, take this derivative again. Now, unfortunately, that means doing a product rule on this term and also a product rule on that term. So let me uh, blast through that. So the product rule on this first term says two derivatives, dz squared, and then e to the i kz comes along for the ride, plus this derivative acting here gives me derivative of psi with respect to z, e to the i k z, running out of marker here, times i k. Let me erase all this. Okay, now I need to take the derivative here. This is plus d psi dz the i k z i k. So it's another copy of the same term. Plus, finally, the derivative acting on the last one will just bring down another copy of i k. So I get psi to the i k z, and then i k squared is minus k squared. Okay, so so these two are the same. So I'm just going to replace that with two two of those. And finally, what I need to do is I need to take this, which is the Laplacian, which is this plus this plus this, and I need to add to it k squared e plus, which is just psi e to the i k z plus k squared. I'm going to add all those, add all those together with one big plus symbol, and that's what gives me my equation here. So let me go up here. And you can see that the last, the last terms are going to cancel. So in some sense, I've automatically satisfied this k squared. So this term is going to cancel with that term. And I'm left with the Laplacian of psi. So this plus this plus this. Plus some extra stuff that I'm going to have to argue about. All right, so, so this equation here tells me that zero equals two derivatives with respect to x of psi plus two derivatives with respect to y of psi. Uh, let, me, let me write it even more compactly. Plus two derivatives with respect to z. Um, plus two of those terms, two i k one derivative with respect to z psi. And I've just canceled out all of the e to the i k z because the e to the i k z is present in every term. So I can just cancel it out. All right, so, so now what have I shown? Well, if I can find a psi that satisfies this equation, which you, doesn't look much simpler than this equation, then 
when I multiply that by ikz, it also satisfies this Helmholtz equation. All right, so now, now is the key. And I'm gonna make an approximation. I'm gonna say, I'm gonna make the approximation that, that this envelope here, this psi, changes slowly compared to this fast changing phase factor. So, so let's take a look at our, our uh, animation again. And I'll show you what I mean here. So all of these stripes are pretty much a result of just this e to the i k z term. And the, the, the thing that's multiplying a bunch of vertical stripes is the slowly changing envelope, psi. And you can see that the envelope as a function of z, the fastest thing that's changing is, is this, uh, these, these stripes here. As I move in z, the amplitude here changes a little bit. And because these start to curve, the phase changes a little bit. But uh, the, the envelope, the thing that's multiplying these fast vertical stripes, that is changing much more slowly than the vertical stripes themselves. And that's the approximation I'm going to make. And if a solution that I get satisfies that approximation, then it was a good approximation. So let's let me formalize that a little bit. What what is the actual manipulation of this equation I'm going to do? Well, let me just say that how fast is this changing? Well, this this is changing. Uh, Every, every lambda, it, it goes through a full two pi of phase. Every, every wavelength goes through a full two pi of phase. So we wanna say that for, for small delta z, for delta z much, much less than, well, yeah, for delta z much, much less than lambda, the envelope, psi, should not change very much. So want, want delta psi, to be much, much less than psi. So let me manipulate these. Let me divide one equation by another here. And I want delta psi over delta z to be much, much less than psi itself over lambda. And since delta z is really small, we can turn this into a derivative. So this is So what this means is that the derivative of psi is small. Small compared to what? Well, small compared to psi over lambda. That's the relevant thing to say that psi is not changing much as long as we're not changing, uh, not changing z that much. And I, I don't have lambdas in this equation, I have k's, but I can write, uh, remember k was, omega over c, which is the same thing as two pi, two pi over uh, lambda. And if I'm in some media, then I actually wanna put in an index of refraction n. But the factor of n is kind of order one, the factor of two pi is not gonna change this much, much, much less than, so I can write that the derivative with respect to z is much, much less than k times psi, right? If this is true, then this is also gonna be true. I just moved lambda up to the numerator and any factors of order one or two pi kind of don't matter in this much, much less than. All right, so, so what does this mean? This means that if we're gonna make this approximation that the envelope, that psi is changing much more slowly than the, the wavelength, uh, phases, then we can ignore the second derivative compared to the first derivative, All right? So this, I can write the second derivative as uh, a derivative acting on psi. And that derivative acting on psi is gonna be much, much less than this factor of two i k multiplying psi. So I'm gonna do that approximation by drop, dropping this term. 
So all of this stuff says that I can drop second second derivative term. So what what we're restricting ourselves to is we're restricting ourselves to beams that don't don't change profile on the order of a single wavelength. So all of the changes in Z are going to be a little bit smoother, well, are going to be smoother than single wavelengths. And, and when I do that, I get, let me erase all this stuff. I get an equation that we can play with a little bit more readily. So when I do that, I can write this equation here as a transverse Laplacian, which is just two derivatives with respect to x plus two derivatives with respect to y plus 2ik, 2ik um, times a single z derivative, all acting on this psi is zero. Um, and the book makes a, a nice analogy here, which I'll, I'll mention briefly, although we're not going to do too much on it. If I look at the two-dimensional Schrodinger equation, so time two-dimensional time-dependent Schrodinger equation, so this is for a, a wave function not, not in one dimension like you would do in baby quantum, but in two dimensions, like on the surface of, on the surface of graphene or something, you know, some some material where uh, the relevant quantum mechanics happens on scales much longer than the thickness of the material. So the two dimensional Schrodinger equation is same thing here. So transverse Laplacian minus. Uh, was, but, but let me let me write this. Let me write it in the way it's typically written. So is minus h bar squared over 2m Laplacian squared. And here, since the wave function is only existing in two dimensions, we're only going to worry about two dimensions, plus some potential v of x, y, psi is i h bar time derivative of psi. And we're going to see that this, this equation here looks like the Schrodinger equation with no potential. So let me just rearrange this to make it look more like this. So uh, transverse Laplacian squared minus 2m over h bar squared v plus, um, I moved this, uh, I moved everything over to the to this side. So plus, uh, 2i m over h bar time derivative all times psi equals zero. So if I were to set the potential equal to zero in the Schrodinger equation, and I were to identify, if I were to take this equation and turn z z into time and turn k into m over h bar, I would get this, this equation. And if you remember from, from quantum mechanics, certainly in big quantum, you're going to talk about it eventually. But in baby quantum, if you had a, a Gaussian wave packet and you let it evolve forward in time, the Gaussian wave packet is going to spread out. So same thing here. If we start with a Gaussian at the origin and we move forward in z, the Gaussian is just going to grow. It's going to get bigger and bigger. So uh, there's a nice analogy here between the two equations. Uh, but yeah. OK, so let me, let, me write, let me write a few things here in the remaining 10 minutes. Uh, I will 
write out what this is in, not in terms of x squared and y squared, but in terms of uh, r, r squared and theta squared. So we're gonna go to cylindrical coordinates. And then I'll define a bunch of terms and write a solution that satisfies this equation. And if I have some time, maybe I'll go over to my desktop and I'll show you how to check that solution in Mathematica. But it's not, it's not much more enlightening than just plugging it in and doing, doing a lot of math. But you, know, you could say that solution is inspired by this sort of Gaussian wave spreading in, uh, in quantum mechanics and all the math techniques that you may learn to solve that problem, uh, which cer certainly you dwell a lot on in, in a class like big quantum. All right, so let me, let me do that. Let me actually erase all this Schrodinger equation analogy stuff since that was just an, a side note to motivate why Gaussians at the origin will spread to become bigger Gaussians as, as Z gets bigger. Well, let me actually write, write what this equation is. So, so what is this transverse Laplacian here? So dt squared acting on psi. Well, I could write it in Cartesian coordinates, but in cylindrical coordinates, it's going to be one over r times the root of the respect to r. And again, r is uh, just x, x and y, not x, y, and z, because we're cylindrical, not spherical coordinates. r times psi dr plus one over r squared, two derivatives of the psi with respect to phi. And, and we're, we're just going to consider, so consider, consider rate, uh, axially symmetric solutions for now. So as you rotate around the axis, nothing, nothing changes. The solution just depends on x squared plus y squared. So given this, I can write this equation as one over r, or respect to r, oops, r psi dr um, plus 2i k or with respect to z. Um, equals zero. That's that's what that equation becomes. Um, and I'll write a whole family of solutions to this equation that all look like the things I plotted. And let me define a bunch of terms, and then I'll write the write the actual solution. And the solution that I write is just the thing that I plotted. So, so these solutions are a whole family of solutions. They're defined by, by one parameter. Well, I guess two parameters. There's a wavelength, which has to do with K. Uh, and then there's the, the beam waste, W. So, so K, the two parameters are K equals two pi over lambda. Maybe you, there's a factor of n here. You want to do index of refraction if you're in some media. But then the other parameter that defines this, well, yeah, the other parameter that defines this equation is the beam waste, w. So this is kind of annoying because this, I'll try to distinguish w from omega. Uh, it's a little bit, it's the beam waste omega. Uh, sorry, the beam waste w, not the angular frequency omega. And we usually specify W at the, at the origin, the middle. And I'll, and I'll show you pictures about what, what this physically means in a second. But let me kind of define some other parameters that, that I'll use in the solution. There's this thing called Z, Z naught, which is a half K times W naught squared. Uh, this, if I were to plug this in here, uh, this is just pi, uh, pi times w naught squared over lambda. Actually, you know what? Let me, let me not work with the. Let me just work in in free space for a second. All right. There's a function. 
w as a function of z. So this is the beam waste, how fat the beam is at, at z equals zero. This is how fat the beam will be as a function of z. This is w zero times the square root of one plus z over z naught squared. So at the origin when z equals zero, this is just w naught and it grows as you go out in z. And then there's r, r of z, which is z times one plus uh, the opposite of this, z naught over z squared. Um, for those of you who haven't had me, I put little slashes through my z's like a European because otherwise they would look like twos. And, and this, we'll see, has something to do with the curvature radius of those wave fronts. All right, so, so with all of this defined, let me actually write what the solution to this equation is. So remember that I'm just writing, uh, I'm gonna write what E plus is, which solves this Helmholtz equation. And it's gonna look a little, a little complicated and ugly, but one can check by just taking derivatives that it satisfies that equation. So E plus, plus of R equals, so remember it equals psi times E to the I K Z. So psi is gonna be, uh, I'll sort of point out where psi is in here. So there's some, some overall constant amplitude that we'll leave unspecified. W naught over W of Z, the function I just defined above. e to the minus r squared over w of z squared. So this is where we get our Gaussian profile, right? As I go away from the origin in x or y, I fall off like a Gaussian. I fall off as minus r squared. And the characteristic, like the sigma of that Gaussian is this w of z. Uh, and all this is times e to the i k z. So that's coming from here. Minus, this is kind of the weirdest term, minus i arctangent of z over z naught. So this is the longitudinal phase. So this is how, how does the phase change as I go in Z? Well, every wavelength that goes by two pi, plus there's this extra little term here. And arctangent, if you'll recall, oh, there's another term here, which I'll write in a second. I'll, I'll discuss the arctangent in a second times X of I K R squared over two R of Z. And, and here again, this is purely a, a complex uh, magnitude one thing, which has to do with the, uh, the, the phase is quadratic in, in R. So let me, let me talk about a few of these terms for the next three minutes. If I look at the intensity here, the intensity of this wave, well, these are all just e to the i somethings. So the intensity only depends on this first term. So, Intensity itself, which is two over this eta magnitude of E plus squared. So this is only gonna depend on this first term. All right, this is gonna be two over eta magnitude of E plus naught squared times, let me make that more clear, W naught squared over W of Z squared times e to the minus two r squared over w of z squared. So the intensity of the beam only depends on this first term. Um, the, the phase is dominated by this, but there's this extra arctangent term. And what does the arctangent look like? Well, if I were to plot it, arctangent starts off at minus pi over two 
and then goes up to plus pi over two. So as long as you're not right near the origin, as long as you're sort of farther, far enough out, um, this just asymptotes to some constant phase offset, which you don't even notice because this one is just changing stripe-like stripe quite quickly. And then this is the phase that, that determines the curvature. All right, so, so we'll talk about all these things more next time and I'll relate them a little bit closer to the, the picture that we showed. But uh, if, you, if you were to take this solution here with these definitions and just start taking derivatives, you know, do this, take, take a derivative with respect to R, multiply by R, take another derivative, multiply by one over R, take a derivative with respect to Z, multiply by that. Uh, you would find that even though it looks kind of complicated, all these things end up canceling. So I'm not, I'm not gonna go through the process of, of how one might have guessed that this is a solution. Uh, but those are the kind of techniques you'll, you'll talk about in, in quantum mechanics class when you do, uh, do uh, things like uh, simple harmonic oscillator solutions. But um, I, I can show you the Mathematica file next time that you, know, it just, you plug it in and everything cancels, you just get zero. All right, so are there any questions in the last minute? I know this was pretty, pretty math heavy and next lecture will be a lot about interpreting what all these terms mean and what they do and how they show up and what happens when you change the parameters. All right, then I will see you on Friday for more pretty pictures. Bye.